Okay, external entity injection part two. Remember, the whole point of this series is to answer the why. Why are we trying this technique or payload or exploit, whatever it may be? And to me, that's the most absolute important takeaway that you can have from any labs that you do. Otherwise, you have a whole bunch of techniques, but no knowledge on how to apply those techniques to an actual application. So let's do a quick recap of last week, and the screen's about to get a little messy, so I'm gonna hide down here for a little bit. First things first, if I see XML being passed anywhere in the request, I'm gonna declare a local entity. If I get no error, then I'm gonna reference that entity using a general entity somewhere in an existing data field in the XML document. So if I have a store ID as an element, and I know it's an element that the application is looking for, I'll try to reference that entity there. If that just straight up works and I get, some, and I get no error at all, that takes us down exploitation path number one. From here, I'll change the local entity to an external entity to see if I can read any local files. If I get the file returned from the response, perfect, exploitation confirmed. If I don't, then I'm gonna try an SSRF to our external server. If I get a request or a DNS lookup from the application, that's looking like a solid candidate for out of band exfiltration of data. Now taking a step back, instead of going down exploitation path one, if I instead get an error when I try to reference that entity via a general entity in the XML document, then I'll try to change that to a parameter entity. And if I get no errors when I declare and reference a parameter entity in the doc type, then great, it's time for some out of band exfiltration. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna dive into these labs. It's gonna cover some more advanced exploitation, but don't worry, I'll make sure that we walk through this step by step and talk about why we're gonna try each of these techniques. Okay, lab six dives into a pretty interesting topic. In this case, we wanna exfiltrate a multi-line file, Etsy password. Now, it's a continuation to lab five where we're still able to exfiltrate data out of band using an external DTD with stacked entities or dynamically declared entities. But on lab five, we exfiltrated Etsy hostname and there was no problem. But exfiltrating Etsy password, because of that new line character, exfiltration over HTTP either only gives us the first line of the file or we get nothing returned at all. So what can we do? Well, we have two different options. The first one is we can use FTP. You have to remember with SSRF using external entities, we could pretty much use whatever URI scheme we want. We could even do PHP filter and base64 encode files, HTTP or FTP. But in this case, because of egress restrictions, we're only able to get requests sent from the application to go to Burp Collaborator or the exploit server. So that's a no-go here. The second option is using error messages. So if the application does return error messages in relation to XML parsing, then technically we can trigger an error message. And within that error message will be the contents of the file that we're trying to exfiltrate. I know it probably sounds a little complicated, but let's go ahead and dive right in and see if we can get into detail here. Okay, so we have the lab here. We'll click view details, grab that request, check stock, throw that to repeater with control R. That looks good. So what we can do here is we can just initially declare an entity like we did last time. So what we'll do is we'll tack on that payload from last time entity, and we're gonna go ahead and load DTD from the exploit server. And then we also need to reference load DTD stack exploit or er, exfil. Close the doc type. Now we'll go to our exploit server and we'll go ahead and we need three entities technically. We need a file entity, which is the file that we're trying to exfiltrate. Let's see, we'll do hostname just to be safe for now. Just so we can do a known good payload here. Stack, which is gonna stack those entities. Entity. And then we need a character reference here because of the inline percent sign. This is going to be exfil system. And this is going to be HTTP S. It's going to be our exploit server. Let's go ahead and copy this. And at the end of this is going to be our file. Send it. If we refresh, we'll see that we have the contents of Etsy hostname returned. Now let's try changing that to Etsy password. Store, send. And you'll see the application error changes here. And if we refresh this access log, we only have exploit returned here. So in this case, we get an error, a legal character in URL. So that new line character is throwing an error here. So what we need to do is we just change this up a little bit. So instead of stack, or excuse me, instead of exfil, we're just gonna change this to error. And we don't really need to change the name of this error, this entity, but we're doing so just for um, clarity's sake. 
instead of sending the contents of this file entity to our exploit server, what we're going to do is we're going to trigger an error condition. So we're going to have this error entity reference a non-existent resource. So I do not exist. And then forward slash the contents of the file that we're trying to exfiltrate. So what's going to happen is the XML parser is going to evaluate this error entity and it's going to try to reach out to a non-existent resource and it's going to return an error containing, hey, we can't find the file. I do not exist forward slash all of Etsy password. So we're going to store this, send this, and boom, now we see the contents of Etsy password. Because if we look at this application error, it's saying the I do not exist forward slash Etsy password, no such file or directory. So that's a pretty cool way of exfiltrating multi-line files in band. But remember, it does require out of band interaction because in order for you to be able to stack entities or declare dynamic entities within another entity, you need to have an external DTD. So it does require that in this case. And it also does require that the application have XML parsing errors. So while it is pretty particular when you can exploit this, when you can, it's really useful to exfiltrate a lot of sensitive data from multi-line files. Lab number seven is about using Xinclude to retrieve files. So before we dive into Xinclude, let's talk about when you would try XXE. Let's say you have a request and we'll jump to our lab here. Let's say you have a request that looks like this. We'll throw this to repeater. It's normal www URL encoded post body. Um, and so you, when you look at this, you might think, oh, well, maybe this isn't taking XML. So whenever you see a request, especially an API request, let's say it looks something like this. And we're gonna use uh, our burp extension content type converter to kind of make this a little bit easier to see. Let's say it looks like this and it's common JSON. Well, just because an application accepts or expects JSON doesn't mean that it doesn't accept XML. So it's always worth when you're doing API testing to see if the application takes JSON, can I just convert it to XML? And will it just take it? So deleting the root nodes, for example, it's always good to check, okay, maybe the application expects JSON, but they can also parse XML when they're given XML. So it's always important to give that a try. But in this specific case, we see that it doesn't accept JSON, it doesn't accept XML if we set the content type to, to as such, right? So what you can do in this specific case is why not try something like this? Let's call an entity that doesn't exist. So we actually need to do entity and we need to URL encode that ampersand because if we don't URL encode it, it's going to think it's an extra or it's a delineation of a new parameter. So when you send this, do you get an error? In this case, we do. Entities are not allowed for security reasons. So this error is key because it's showing that the application is actually parsing this as XML. So parsing whatever we input as XML. Now with Xinclude, Xinclude is really cool because what you could do is you can use it when you don't have control over the entire XML document. It's really useful in SOAP requests as well too, because sometimes you'll have your data is being sent to a backend service and that backend service is actually parsing that XML from there. And so if you're able to trigger this error condition, it's pretty useful. So if you have a fuzzing list that you use when you're fuzzing for different types of vulnerabilities, it's always useful, useful to have some type of entity declaration or excuse me, entity reference that doesn't exist. That way, if you get a triggered error condition, you know, okay, well maybe it is parsing my XML. So now I can try something like Xinclude. So Xinclude payloads tend to be pretty standard. What we have to do is we have to go ahead and reference the, uh, the Xinclude namespace first, which we do here. And then from there, we can reference this file via an Xinclude parse equals text and href equals file Etsy password. And when we reference this, in this case, we actually get the results of the file that we reference in the exact response. Again, the only reason that this works in this specific case is because we're actually getting the results of product ID returned to us. If I try to reference a product ID that doesn't exist, test as a string, it'll say invalid product ID. So without that in band reference or confirmation, we'll have to do additional types of attacks or techniques to exfiltrate the data out of band which is non-trivial in this case because we don't control the entire doc type. But in this specific case, it works good because we're getting errors that give us what we want. Exploiting XXE to retrieve data using a local DTD. So when would you want to use something like this? Well, let's see. Let's say you have an application that accepts XML. You know it does. You're able to declare entities and you're getting no errors, but you're not able to retrieve data in band because there's no reflection of your injected input and you're not able to retrieve data out of band because any calls to your out of band server get shut down by the egress filters. So this is where you wanna try something like referencing a local DTD and then repurposing an existing entity within that local DTD to see if you could trigger an error 
and retrieve that data. So let's go ahead and give that a try. So we have the lab here. We'll go ahead and check stock and that sends that post parameter or that post request that contains our XML object. When we send this, everything's looking good. If we try to inject something into product ID that is non-existent, it doesn't return the contents of what we injected in product ID. So inbound exfiltration is a no-go. And we're just gonna assume that out-of-band exfiltration is a no-go as well too. So what we'll do is I'll, we'll go ahead and declare our entity and doc type here. And we're gonna make this a parameter entity here. And so when we give it Etsy password, we see the application response with an error because of an XML parsing error, okay? But what happens if we give it a file that does not, it does not exist? So we have a non-existent file and it returns with a different error. So no such file or directory. So what we need to do is we need to reference a DTD file that we know exists. And so how do you know? Well, GoSecure has an awesome list. GoSecure actually has, actually has a pretty good walkthrough that we're gonna be following. And they have an awesome list of different types of DTD files that are expected and enumerated that they've already um, compiled the list for us. So what we'll do is we'll grab this list, copy it to clipboard. We'll throw this to intruder. And we're gonna add positions around this file here. So that's gonna be where our intruder payloads are going to go. Paste the list. We're gonna turn off URL encoding so it doesn't URL encode our forward slashes or periods or anything and start attack. So we're gonna let this run and I'll be right back. Okay, so that ran. And what we could do is we could filter on status code. So when we have a status code of 200, we could see that these are actual local DTDs that exist on the server. So in this case, we have font config forward slash fonts, docbook x.dtd. So I know the lab calls for using docbook x.dtd, but we're gonna get a little crafty and we're gonna use font x instead. So what you could do is once you enumerate a list of valid DTDs, you can look online to see if you can find any published payloads that show how you can overwrite existing entities and exfiltrate data. So luckily GoSecure actually has a proof of concept using fonts.dtd. So what we can do is we can actually copy this entity declaration. So local DTD is gonna stay the same, but instead of local DTD, we're gonna just call it gar because that's already how we have it referenced here. So we have the local DTD described here. So we'll call that gar. And what this is going to do, this actually overwrites the EXPR entity defined here. So you could see the EXPR entity, which is an entity that already exists in fonts.dtd, as you could see up here, is actually being overwritten by everything in these single quotes. We need to reference an entity that exists in the local DTD, otherwise we get a non-existent entity error. Then we override that entity with exactly what we saw in lab six. But first we need to change the file entity to the file that we want to read, so Etsy password. And then on line 19, we have the entity error, which points to the non-existent resource, ABC XYZ forward slash the contents of Etsy password. So just like in lab six, the application should return an error saying, no such file or directory, ABC XYZ forward slash the contents of Etsy password, like we see right here. So that was cool. This is a really cool instance of where, okay, you can have confirmed XXE, but you're not able to retrieve data. Using this local DT DTD repurpose is really useful in cases like this, where you have really strong egress, no reflection of any type of injected input, and it still lets you get what you need at the end of the day. So when you think of file upload, you think of a lot of things, right? Like RCE, possibly XSS, authorization issues, et cetera, right? But do you ever think of XXE? Well, in this case, if you upload a file, like an SVG file, then you might be able to get XXE. And what an SVG file is, is it's essentially just an XML file that describes a vector image. So you can see here on the left, we have this SVG, this is the actual contents of an SVG file. And all it does is it pretty much describes a vector image. Well, what we can do is we can try to upload an SVG file that references an entity. And then from there, can it return the results of that declared entity? If not, can we actually exfiltrate data out of band? So let's go ahead and look at the lab. So in this lab, it's a basic blog website. And if we click on, on posts, we can make comments. I'm not seeing any type of login or authentication workflow. It looks like we could just leave a comment here. So what we could do is we can go ahead and leave a comment, test, testing T at T. So what we'll do here is we'll actually just download this SVG. So what we'll do is we'll copy this, open up our terminal. We'll use nano to make test.svg, control shift V to paste. And then we'll upload this benign SVG file, test.svg. When we post this comment, you can see in the actual post request we sent, it sent a post request to post forward slash comment. And the actual contents of our SVG is here in this avatar parameter. So if we go back to blog, we should be able to see that image. And that looks like what we expected. 
So what we can do here is we can try to see if we can reference an entity within that SVG file. So I have two files here. One of them is hacker one, the SVG, and the other one is hostname, the SVG. And these both are essentially the same thing, except one is using an external entity rec declaration, and the other one is using that image X link, which is a little bit different. So what we'll do is we'll do this external entity declaration one. I'm gonna copy it. And instead of just uploading the file, I'm just gonna send this request to repeater again and get rid of our original SVG that we sent and replace it with this. So instead of referencing the metadata API like we're doing here, let's go ahead and call Etsy hostname because I believe that's the goal of this lab. So we send the request, we get a 302 found, we can refresh the blog page. Let's take a look. If we look at this image, we can open image in new tab or copy image location, paste the URL, boom. So you can see this looks like some random text, but this is actually the host name. So what we can do is we can actually bring this over here so we can see it and type it out. And then we actually need to enter that up top here to submit the solution. And you can see that was the correct host name. So there is a couple things to take into account here. In order for us to actually be able to see if this is actually returned in band, we need to be able to access that SVG and look at it. But let's say that we actually didn't get any confirmation that this actually resolved or referenced the host name. We can try an out of band reference. So what we can do here is go to collaborator client, copy it to clipboard, and instead of referencing Etsy hostname, we can instead do an external entity reference to our collaborator server. Then when we, refresh, when we refresh that blog page and then pull now, we check to see if we get that reference. And we do, and it's from a, a 5.2 IP address. So this is referenced from the actual application itself. So from here, we can do out of band exfiltration if we weren't able to get this in band data exfiltration. So once again, you find an image upload, see if it takes SVG. If it doesn't take SVG, is that client side or is it server side? There's a lot of different ways to circumvent client side file type restrictions and sometimes even server side ones. But this at least gets the feet wet and shows you what you can do with SVG files. Well, that was external entity injection. That's a really fun vulnerability. I wouldn't say it's really common, but you'd be surprised. Sometimes the application doesn't look like it accepts XML, but you change a content type or you get a little tricky and you find out it does. And then maybe you can exploit this vulnerability yourself in the wild. Well, I hope you learned something from this video. I'm really excited to be able to put out this content. Uh, if you want some more from me, feel free to check me out on my Twitch. I stream every Monday and Thursday. You can always reach out to me there or on Twitter. If you like the content, feel free to leave a like. Any feedback, super appreciated. Leave a comment below. I love to hear about everybody's individual experiences and their journey through information security, and hopefully I can provide some help along the way. Well, I'll see you around next time. I definitely plan to make this a series, so I'll definitely see you soon with the next vulnerability. But leave a comment letting me know what vulnerability you want to see next. But anyway, that's all I got for you. Until next time, see you later. See you soon. Bye now. Okay. Cut the video.